The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.B. A Bibliographical Note by Walter Gerald. Barry Lyndon, far from the best known, but by some critics acclaimed as the finest of Thackeray's works, appeared originally as a serial a few years before Vanity Fair was written, yet it was not published in book form, and then not by itself, until after the publication of Vanity Fair, Pendennis, Esmond, and The Newcombs had placed its author in the forefront of the literary men of the day. So many years after the event, we cannot help wondering why the story was not earlier put in book form, for in its delineation of the character of an adventurer, it is as great as Vanity Fair, while for the local color of history, if I may put it so, it is no undistinguished precursor of Esmond. In the number of Fraser's Magazine for January 1844 appeared the first installment of The Luck of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, a romance of the last century by Fitzboodle, and the story continued to appear month by month, with the exception of October, up to the end of the year, when the concluding portion was signed G. S. Fitzboodle. Fitzboodle's confessions, it should be added, had appeared occasionally in the magazine during the years immediately precedent, so that the pseudonym was familiar to Fraser's readers. The story was written, according to its author's own words, with a great deal of dullness, unwillingness, and labor, and was evidently done as the installments were required, for in August he wrote, read for B. L. all the morning at the club, and four days later of B.L. lying like a nightmare on my mind. The journey to the east, which was to give us in literary results notes of a journey from Cornhill to Grand Cairo, was begun with Barry Lyndon yet unfinished, for at Malta the author noted on the first three days of November, wrote Barry but slowly and with great difficulty. Wrote Barry with no more success than yesterday. Finished Barry after great throes late at night. In the number of Fraser's for the following month, as I have said, the conclusion appeared. A dozen years later, in 1856, the story formed the first part of the third volume of Thackeray's Miscellanies, when it was called Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, written by himself. Since then, it has nearly always been issued with other matter, as though it were not strong enough to stand alone or as though the importance of a work was mainly to be gauged by the number of pages to be crowded into one cover. The scheme of the present edition fortunately allows fitting honor to be done to the memoirs of the great adventurer. To come from the story as a whole to the personality of the eponymous hero. Three widely differing historical individuals are suggested as having contributed to the composite portrait. Best known of these was that very prince among adventurers, G. J. Casanova de saint Galt, a man who in the latter half of the eighteenth century played the part of adventurer, and generally that of the successful adventurer, in most of the European capitals, who within the first five and twenty years of his life had been abbe, secretary to Cardinal Aquaviva, ensign, and violinist at Rome, Constantinople, Corfu, and his own birthplace, Venice, where he cured a senator of apoplexy. His autobiography, Memoirs Écrits par Lui-même, in twelve volumes, has been described as unmatched as a self-revelation of scoundrelism. It has also been suggested, with I think far less color of probability, that the original of Barry was the diplomatist and satiric poet Sir Charles Hanbury Williams, whom Dr. Johnson described as our lively and elegant, though too licentious, lyric bard. The third, and original, and one who, there cannot be the slightest doubt, contributed features to the great portrait, is a certain Andrew Robinson Stoney, afterwards Stoney Bowes. The original of the Countess Linden was Mary Eleanor Bowes, Dowager Countess of Strathmore, and heiress of the very wealthy Durham family. This lady had many suitors, but in 1777 Stoney, a bankrupt lieutenant on half pay who had fought a duel in her behalf, induced her to marry him, and subsequently hyphenated her name with his own. He became Member of Parliament, and ran such extravagant courses as does Barry Lyndon, treated his wife with similar barbarity, 
abducted her when she had escaped from him, and then, after being divorced, found his way to a debtor's prison. There are similarities here which no seeker after originals can overlook. Mrs. Ritchie says that her father had a friend at Paris, quote, a Mr. Bowes, who may have first told him this history, of which the details are almost incredible, as quoted from the papers of the time, end quote. The name of Thackeray's friend is a curious coincidence, unless, as may well have been the case, he was a connection of the family into which the notorious adventurer had married. It is not unlikely that Thackeray had seen the work published in 1810, the year of Stony Bowes's death, in which the whole unhappy romance was set forth. This was The Lives of Andrew Robinson Bowes, Esquire, and the Countess of Strathmore, written from thirty-three years' professional attendance, from letters and other well-authenticated documents by Jesse Foote, surgeon. In this book we find several incidents similar to the ones in the story. Bowes cut down all the timber on his wife's estate, but the neighbors would not buy it. Such practical jokes as Barry Lyndon played upon his son's tutor were played by Bowes on his chaplain. The story of Stoney and his marriage will be found briefly given in the notice of the Countess's life in the Dictionary of National Biography. Whence that part of the romantic interlude dealing with the stay in the Duchy of X, dealt with in Chapter 10, etc., was inspired, Thackeray's own notebooks, as quoted by Mrs. Ritchie, conclusively show. January 4th, 1844. Read in a silly book called L'Empire, a good story about the first K of Wertenberg's wife. Killed by her husband for adultery. Frederick William, born in 1834, Question mark. Married in 1780, the Princess Caroline of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel, who died the 27th September 1788. For the rest of the story, see L'Empire, ou Dissant sous Napoleon par un Chamberlain, Paris, à Lardin, 1836, Volume 1, 220. The Captain Frenny, to whom Barry owed his adventures on his journey to Dublin, Chapter 3, was a notorious highwayman on whose doings Thackeray had enlarged in the fifteenth chapter of his Irish sketch-book. Despite the slowness with which it was written, and the seeming neglect with which it was permitted to remain unreprinted, Barry Lyndon was to be hailed by competent critics as one of Thackeray's finest performances, though the author himself seems to have no strong regard for the story. His daughter is recorded, quote, My father once said to me when I was a girl, You needn't read Barry Lyndon you won't like it. Indeed, it is scarcely a book to like, but one to admire and to wonder at, for its consummate power and mastery." Another novelist, Anthony Trollope, has said of it, In imagination, language, construction, and general literary capacity, Thackeray never did anything more remarkable than Barry Lyndon. Mr. Leslie Stevens says, All later critics have recognized in this book one of his most powerful performances. In directness and vigor he never surpassed it. W. J. End of A Bibliographical Note Chapter 1, Part 1 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire by William Makepeace Thackeray This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. My Pedigree and Family. Undergo the Influence of the Tender Passion. Part 1. Since the days of Adam, there has been hardly a mischief done in this world, but a woman has been at the bottom of it. Ever since ours was a family, and that must be very near Adam's time, so old, noble, and illustrious are the berries, as everybody knows, women have played a mighty part with the destinies of our race. I presume that there is no gentleman in Europe that has not heard of the house of Barry, of Barry Oak, of the Kingdom of Ireland, than which a more famous name is not to be found in Gwillem or Dozier, and though, as a man of the world, I have learned to despise heartily the claims of some pretenders to high birth, who have no more genealogy than the lackey who cleans my boots, and though I laugh to utter scorn the boasting of many of my countrymen, who are all for descending from kings of Ireland, and talk of a domain no bigger than would feed a pig as if it were a principality, yet truth compels me to assert that my family was the noblest of the island, 
and perhaps of the universal world while their possessions now insignificant and torn from us by war by treachery by the loss of time by ancestral extravagance by adhesion to the old faith and monarch were formerly prodigious and embraced many counties at a time when ireland was vastly more prosperous than now i would assume the irish crown over my coat of arms but that there are so many silly pretenders to that distinction who bear it and render it common who knows but for the fault of a woman i might have been wearing it now you start with incredulity i say why not had there been a gallant chief to lead my countrymen instead of pulling knaves who bent the knee to king richard the second they might have been freemen had there been a resolute leader to meet the murderous ruffian oliver cromwell we should have shaken off the english forever but there was no barry in the field against the usurper on the contrary my ancestor simone de barry came over with the first named monarch and married the daughter of the then king of munster whose sons in battle he pitilessly slew in oliver's time it was too late for a chief of the name of barry to lift up his war cry against that of the murderous brewer we were princes of the land no longer our unhappy race had lost its possessions a century previously and by the most shameful treason this i know to be the fact for my mother has often told me the story and besides had worked it in a worsted pedigree which hung up in the yellow saloon at berryville where we lived that very estate which the lindens now possess in ireland was once the property of my race rory barry of barry Oge owned it in elizabeth's time and half munster beside the barry was always in feud with the o'mahonies in those times and as it happened a certain english colonel passed through the former's country with a body of men-at-arms on the very day when the o'mahonies had made an inroad upon our territories and carried off a frightful plunder of our flocks and herds this young englishman whose name was roger linden linden or lindane having been most hospitably received by the berry and finding him just on the point of carrying an inroad into the o'mahony's land offered the aid of himself and his lances and behaved himself so well as it appeared that the o'mahony's were overcome all the berry's property restored and with it says the old chronicle twice as much of the o'mahony's goods and cattle it was the setting in of the winter season and the young soldier was pressed by the berry not to quit his house of berry Og, and remained there during several months his men being quartered with berry's own gallow glasses man by man in the cottages round about they conducted themselves as is their wont with the most intolerable insolence towards the irish so much so that fights and murders continually ensued and the people vowed to destroy them the berry's son from whom i descend was as hostile to the english as any other man on his domain and as they would not go when bidden he and his friends consulted together and determined on destroying these english to a man but they had let a woman into their plot and this was the berry's daughter she was in love with the english linden and broke the whole secret to him and the dastardly english prevented the just massacre of themselves by falling on the irish and destroying padrick barry my ancestor and many hundreds of his men the cross at barry cross near carignadule is the spot where the odious butchery took place linden married the daughter of roderick barry and claimed the estate which he left and though the descendants of padrick were alive as indeed they are in my person footnote as we have never been able to find proofs of the marriage of my ancestor padrick with his wife i make no doubt that linden destroyed the contract and murdered the priest and witnesses of the marriage b l End footnote. on appealing to the english courts the estate was awarded to the englishman as has ever been the case where english and irish were concerned thus had it not been for the weakness of a woman i should have been born to the possession of those very estates which afterwards came to me by merit as you shall hear but to proceed with my family history my father was well known in the best circles in this kingdom as in that of ireland under the name of roaring harry berry 
he was bred like many other sons of genteel families to the profession of the law being articled to a celebrated attorney of sackville street in the city of dublin and from his great genius and aptitude for learning there is no doubt he would have made an eminent figure in his profession had not his social qualities love of field sports and extraordinary graces of manner marked him out for a higher sphere while he was an attorney's clerk he kept seven racehorses and hunted regularly both with the kildare and wicklow hunts and rode on his grey horse endymion that famous match against captain punter which is still remembered by lovers of the sport and of which i caused a splendid picture to be made and hung over my dining-hall mantelpiece at castle linden a year afterwards he had the honour of riding that very horse endymion before his late majesty king george the second at newmarket and won the plate there and the attention of the august sovereign although he was only the second son of our family my dear father came naturally into the estate now miserably reduced to four hundred pounds a year for my grandfather's eldest son cornelius berry called the chevalier borne from a wound which he received in germany remained constant to the old religion in which our family was educated and not only served abroad with credit but against his most sacred majesty george the second in the unhappy scotch disturbances in forty five we shall hear more of the chevalier hereafter for the conversion of my father i have to thank my dear mother miss bell brady daughter of ulysses brady of castle brady county Kerry, esq and j p she was the most beautiful woman of her day in dublin and universally called the dasher there seeing her at the assembly my father became passionately attached to her but her soul was above marrying a papist or an attorney's clerk and so for the love of her the good old laws being then in force my dear father slipped into my uncle cornelius's shoes and took the family estate besides the force of my mother's bright eyes several persons and of the genteelest society too contributed to this happy change and i have often heard my mother laughingly tell the story of my father's recantation which was solemnly pronounced at the tavern in the company of sir dick ringwood lord bagwig captain punter and two or three other young sparks of the town roaring harry won three hundred pieces that very night at Faro, and laid the necessary information the next morning against his brother but his conversion caused a coolness between him and my uncle corney who joined the rebels in consequence the great difficulty being settled my lord bagwig lent my father his own yacht then lying at the pigeon house and the handsome bell brady was induced to run away with him to england although her parents were against the match and her lovers as i have heard her tell many thousands of times were among the most numerous and most wealthy in all the kingdom of ireland they were married at the savoy and my grandfather dying very soon harry berry esq took possession of his paternal property and supported our illustrious name with credit in london he pinked the famous count tiercelin behind montague house he was a member of white's and a frequenter of all the chocolate houses and my mother likewise made no small figure at length after his great day of triumph before his sacred majesty at newmarket harry's fortune was just on the point of being made for the gracious monarch promised to provide for him but alas he was taken in charge by another monarch whose will have no delay or denial by death namely who seized upon my father at chester races leaving me a helpless orphan peace be to his ashes he was not faultless and dissipated all our princely family property but he was as brave a fellow as ever tossed a bumper or called a main and he drove his coach and six like a man of fashion i do not know whether his gracious majesty was much affected by the sudden demise of my father though my mother says he shed some royal tears on the occasion but they helped us to nothing and all that was found in the house for the wife and creditors was a purse of ninety guineas which my dear mother naturally took with the family plate and my father's wardrobe and her own and putting them into our great coach drove off to hollyhead whence she took shipping for ireland my father's body accompanied us in the finest hearse and plumes money could buy 
for though the husband and wife had quarrelled repeatedly in life, yet at my father's death his high-spirited widow forgot all her differences, gave him the grandest funeral that had been seen for many a day, and erected a monument over his remains, for which I subsequently paid, which declared him to be the wisest, purest, and most affectionate of men. In performing these sad duties over her deceased lord, the widow spent almost every guinea she had, and indeed would have spent a great deal more had she discharged one-third of the demands which the ceremonies occasioned. But the people around our old house of Berriog, although they did not like my father for his change of faith, yet stood by him at this moment, and before exterminating the mutes sent by Mr. Plumer of London with the lamented remains. The monument and vault in the church were then, alas, all that remained of my vast possessions, for my father had sold every stick of the property to one Notley, an attorney, and we received but a cold welcome in his house. A miserable old tumble-down place it was. Footnote. In another part of his memoir, Mr. Barry will be found to describe this mansion as one of the most splendid palaces in Europe, but this is a practice not unusual with his nation and with respect to the Irish principality claimed by him, it is known that Mr. Barry's grandfather was an attorney and maker of his own fortune. End footnote. The splendor of the funeral did not fail to increase the widow Barry's reputation as a woman of spirit and fashion, and when she wrote to her brother, Michael Brady, that worthy gentleman immediately rode across the country to fling himself in her arms and to invite her in his wife's name to Castle Brady. Mick and Barry had quarrelled, as all men will, and very high words had passed between them during Barry's courtship of Miss Bell. When he took her off, Brady swore he would never forgive Barry or Bell. But coming to London in the year 46, he fell in once more with Roaring Harry and lived in his fine house in Clarges Street and lost a few pieces to him at play, and broke a watchman's head or two in his company. All of which reminiscences endeared Belle and her son very much to the good-hearted gentleman, and he received us both with open arms. Mrs. Barry did not, perhaps wisely, at first make known to her friends what was her condition, but arriving in a huge gilt coach with enormous armorial bearings, was taken by her sister-in-law and the rest of the county for a person of considerable property and distinction. For a time, then, as was right and proper, Mrs. Berry gave the law at Castle Brady. She ordered the servants to and fro and taught them what indeed they much wanted, a little London neatness, and English Redmond, as I was called, was treated like a little lord, and had a maid and a footman to himself and honest Mick paid their wages, which was much more than he was used to do for his own domestics, doing all in his power to make his sister decently comfortable under her afflictions. Mamma, in return, determined that, when her affairs were arranged, she would make her kind brother a handsome allowance for her son's maintenance and her own, and promised to have her handsome furniture brought over from Clarges Street to adorn the somewhat dilapidated rooms of Castle Brady. But it turned out that the rascally landlord seized upon every chair and table that ought by rights to have belonged to the widow. The estate to which I was heir was in the hands of rapacious creditors, and the only means of subsistence remaining to the widow and child was a rent charge of fifty pounds upon my lord Bagwig's property, who had many turf dealings with the deceased. And so my dear mother's liberal intentions towards her brother were, of course, never fulfilled. It must be confessed, very much to the discredit of Mrs. Brady of Castle Brady, that when her sister-in-law's poverty was thus made manifest, she forgot all the respect which she had been accustomed to pay her, instantly turned my maid and manservant out of doors, and told Mrs. Barry that she might follow them as soon as she chose. Mrs. Mick was of a low family and a sordid way of thinking, and after about a couple of years, during which she had saved almost all her little income, the widow complied with Madame Brady's desire, at the same time giving way to a just, though prudently dissimulated resentment. She made a vow that she would never enter the gates of Castle Brady while the lady of the house remained alive within them. 
she fitted up her new abode with much economy and considerable taste and never for all her poverty abated a jot of the dignity which was her due and which all the neighbourhood awarded to her how indeed could they refuse respect to a lady who had lived in london frequented the most fashionable society there and had been presented as she solemnly declared at court these advantages gave her a right which seems to be pretty unsparingly exercised in ireland by those natives who have it the right of looking down with scorn upon all persons who have not had the opportunity of quitting the mother country and inhabiting england for a while thus whenever madame brady appeared in a new dress her sister-in-law would say poor creature how can it be expected that she should know anything of the fashion and though pleased to be called the handsome widow as she was mrs berry was still better pleased to be called the english widow mrs brady for her part was not slow to reply she used to say that the defunct berry was a bankrupt and a beggar and as for the fashionable society which he saw he saw it from my lord bagwig's side-table whose flatterer and hanger-on he was known to be regarding mrs berry the lady of castle brady would make insinuations still more painful however why should we allude to these charges or rake up private scandal of a hundred years old it was in the reign of george the second that the above-named personages lived and quarrelled good or bad handsome or ugly rich or poor they are all equal now and do not the sunday papers and the courts of law supply us every week with more novel and interesting slander at any rate it must be allowed that mrs berry after her husband's death and her retirement lived in such a way as to defy slander for whereas bell brady had been the gayest girl in the whole county of wexford with half the bachelors at her feet and plenty of smiles and encouragement for every one of them bell berry adopted a dignified reserve that almost amounted to pomposity and was as starch as any quakeress many a man renewed his offers to the widow who had been smitten by the charms of the spinster but mrs berry refused all offers of marriage declaring that she lived now for her son only and for the memory of her departed saint saint forsooth said ill-natured mrs brady harry berry was as big a sinner as ever was known and tis notorious that he and bell hated each other if she won't marry now depend on it the artful woman has a husband in her eye for all that and only waits until lord bagwig is a widower well, and suppose she did what then was not the widow of a berry fit to marry with any lord of england and was it not always said that a woman was to restore the fortunes of the berry family if my mother fancied that she was to be that woman i think it was a perfectly justifiable notion on her part for the earl my godfather was always most attentive to her i never knew how deeply this notion of advancing my interests in the world had taken possession of mamma's mind until his lordship's marriage in the year fifty seven with miss goldmore the indian nabob's rich daughter meanwhile we continued to reside at berryville and considering the smallness of our income kept up a wonderful state of the half-dozen families that formed the congregation at brady's town there was not a single person whose appearance was so respectable as that of the widow who though she always dressed in mourning in honour of her deceased husband took care that her garments should be made so as to set off her handsome person to the greatest advantage and indeed i think spent six hours out of every day in the week in cutting trimming and altering them to the fashion she had the largest of hoops and the handsomest of furbelows and once a month under my lord bagwig's cover would come a letter from london containing the newest accounts of the fashions there her complexion was so brilliant that she had no call to use rouge as was the mode in those days no she left red and white she said and hence the reader may imagine how the two ladies hated each other to madame brady whose yellow complexion no plaster could alter in a word she was so accomplished a beauty that all the women in the country took pattern by her and the young fellows from ten miles round would ride over to castle brady church to have the sight of her but if like every other woman that ever i saw or read of she was proud of her beauty 
To do her justice, she was still more proud of her son, and has said a thousand times to me that I was the handsomest young fellow in the world. This is a matter of taste. A man of sixty may, however, say what he was at fourteen without much vanity, and I must say I think there was some cause for my mother's opinion. The good soul's pleasure was to dress me, and on Sundays and holidays I turned out in a velvet coat with a silver-hilted sword by my side and a gold garter at my knee as fine as any lord in the land. My mother worked me several most splendid waistcoats, and I had plenty of lace for my ruffles and a fresh ribbon to my hair, and as we walked to church on Sundays, even envious Mrs. Brady was found to allow that there was not a prettier pair in the kingdom. Of course, too, the lady of Castle Brady used to sneer because on those occasions a certain Tim, who used to be called my valet, followed me and my mother to church, carrying a huge prayer book and a cane, and dressed in the livery of one of our own fine footmen from Clarges Street, which, as Tim was a bandy-shanked little fellow, did not exactly become him. But though poor, we were gentlefolks, and not to be steered out of these becoming appendages to our rank, and so would march up the aisle to our pew with as much state as the Lord Lieutenant's lady and son might do. When there, my mother would give the responses and amens in a loud, dignified voice that was delightful to hear, and besides, had a fine, loud voice for singing, which art she had perfected in London under a fashionable teacher. And she would exercise her talent in such a way that you would hardly hear any other voice of the little congregation which chose to join in the psalm. In fact, my mother had great gifts in every way, and believed herself to be one of the most beautiful, accomplished, and meritorious persons in the world. Often and often she has talked to me and the neighbors regarding her own humility and piety, pointing them out in such a way that I would defy the most obstinate to disbelieve her. When we left Castle Brady we came to occupy a house in Brady's town which Mamma christened Berryville. I confess it was but a small place, but indeed we made the most of it. I have mentioned the family pedigree which hung up in the drawing-room, which Mamma called the Yellow Saloon, and my bedroom was called the Pink Bedroom, and hers the Orange Tawny Apartment. How well I remember them all! And at dinner-time Tim regularly rang a great bell, and we each had a silver tankard to drink from, and Mother boasted with justice that I had as good a bottle of claret by my side as any squire of the land. So indeed I had, but I was not, of course, allowed at my tender years to drink any of the wine, which thus attained a considerable age, even in the decanter. Uncle Brady, in spite of the family quarrel, found out the above fact one day by calling at Berryville at dinner-time, and unluckily tasting the liquor. You should have seen how he sputtered and made faces. But the honest gentleman was not particular about his wine or the company in which he drank it. He would get drunk indeed with the parson or the priest indifferently, with the latter to my mother's indignation, for, as a true blue Nassauite, she heartily despised all those of the old faith, and would scarcely sit down in the room with a benighted papist. But the squire had no such scruples. He was indeed one of the easiest, idlest, and best-natured fellows that ever lived, and many an hour would he pass with the lonely widow when he was tired of Madame Brady at home. He liked me, he said, as much as one of his own sons, and at length, after the widow had held out for a couple of years, she agreed to allow me to return to the castle, though, for herself, she resolutely kept the oath which she had made with regard to her sister-in-law. The very first day I returned to Castle Brady my trials may be said, in a manner, to have begun. My cousin, Master Mick, a huge monster of nineteen who hated me, and I promise you I returned the compliment, insulted me at dinner about my mother's poverty, and made all the girls of my family titter. So when we went to the stables, whither Mick always went for his pipe of tobacco after dinner, I told him a piece of my mind, and there was a fight for at least ten minutes, during which I stood to him like a man and blacked his left eye, though I was myself only twelve years old at the time. Of course he beat me, but a beating makes only a small impression on a lad of that tender age, as I had proved many times in battles with the ragged Brady's Town boys before, not one of whom at my time of life was my match. My uncle was very much pleased when he heard of my gallantry. 
my cousin nora brought brown paper and vinegar for my nose and i went home that night with a pint of claret under my girdle not a little proud let me tell you at having held my own against mick so long and though he persisted in his bad treatment of me and used to cane me whenever i fell in his way yet i was very happy now at castle brady with the company there and my cousins or some of them and the kindness of my uncle with whom i became a prodigious favourite he bought a colt for me and taught me to ride he took me out coursing and fowling and instructed me to shoot flying and at length i was released from mick's persecution for his brother master ulick returning from trinity college and hating his elder brother as is mostly the way in families of fashion took me under his protection and from that time as ulick was a deal bigger and stronger than mick english redmond as i was called was left alone except when the former thought fit to thrash me which he did whenever he thought proper nor was my learning neglected in the ornamental parts for i had an uncommon natural genius for many things and soon topped in accomplishment most of the persons around me i had a quick ear and a fine voice which my mother cultivated to the best of her power and she taught me to step a minuet gravely and gracefully and thus laid the foundation for my future success in life the common dances i learned as perhaps i ought not to confess in the servants hall which you may be sure was never without a piper and where i was considered unrivalled both at a hornpipe and a jig in the matter of book learning i had always had an uncommon taste for reading plays and novels as the best part of a gentleman's polite education and never let a peddler pass the village if i had a penny without having a ballad or two from him as for your dull grammar and greek and latin and stuff i have always hated them from my youth upwards and said very unmistakably i'd have none of them thus i proved pretty clearly at the age of thirteen when my aunt biddy brady's legacy of one hundred pounds came in to mamma who thought to employ the sum of my education and sent me to dr tobias tickler's famous academy at ballywacket backwacket as my uncle used to call it but six weeks after i had been consigned to his reverence i suddenly made my appearance again at castle brady having walked forty miles from the odious place and left the doctor in a state near upon apoplexy the fact was that at taw prison bars or boxing i was at the head of the school but i could not be brought to excel in the classics and after having been flogged seven times without its doing me the least good in my latin i refused to submit altogether finding it useless to an eighth application of the rod try some other way sir said i when he was for horsing me once more but he wouldn't whereon and to defend myself i flung a slate at him and knocked down a scotch usher with a leaden inkstand all the lads huzzahed at this and some of the servants wanted to stop me but taking out a large clasp knife which my cousin nora had given me i swore i would plunge it into the waistcoat of the first man who dared to balk me and faith they let me pass on i slept that night twenty miles off ballywacket at the house of a cottier who gave me potatoes and milk and to whom i gave a hundred guineas after when i came to visit ireland in my days of greatness i wish i had the money now but what's the use of regret i have had many a harder bed than i shall sleep on to-night and many a scantier meal than honest phil murphy gave me on the evening i ran away from school so six weeks was all the schooling i ever got and i say this to let parents know the value of it for though i have met more learned bookworms in the world especially a great hulking clumsy bare-eyed old doctor whom they called johnson and who lived in a court off fleet street in london yet i pretty soon silenced him in an argument at button's coffee house and in that and in poetry and what i call natural philosophy or the science of life and in riding music leaping the small sword the knowledge of a horse or a mane of cocks and the manners of an accomplished gentleman and a man of fashion i may say for myself that redmond barry has seldom found his equal sir said i to mr johnson on the occasion i allude to he was accompanied by a mr boswell of scotland and i was presented to the club by a mr goldsmith a countryman of my own sir said i in reply to the schoolmaster's great thundering quotation in greek 
You fancy you know a great deal more than me because you quote your Aristotle and your Pluto. But can you tell me which horse will win at Epsom Downs next week? Can you run six miles without breathing? Can you shoot the ace of spades ten times without missing? If so, talk about Aristotle and Pluto to me. Do you know who you're speaking to? roared out the Scotch gentleman, Mr. Boswell, at this. Hold your tongue, Mr. Boswell said the old schoolmaster. I had no right to brag of my Greek to the gentleman, and he has answered me very well. Doctor, says I, looking waggishly at him, do you know of a rhyme for Aristotle? Port, if you please, says Mr. Goldsmith, laughing. And we had six rhymes for Aristotle before we left the coffee-house that evening. It became a regular joke afterwards when I told the story, and at White's or the Cocoa Tree you would hear the wags say, Waiter, Bring me one of Captain Barry's rhymes for Aristotle. Once, when I was in liquor at the latter place, young Dick Sheridan called me a great staggerite, a joke which I could never understand. But I'm wandering from my story. I must get back to home and dear old Ireland again. I have made acquaintance with the best in the land since, and my manners are such as I have said to make me the equal of them all. And perhaps you will wonder how a country boy, as I was, educated amongst... Irish squires and their dependents of the stable and farm should arrive at possessing such elegant manners as I was indisputably allowed to have. I had, the fact is, a very valuable instructor in the person of an old gamekeeper who had served the French king at Fontenoy, and who taught me the dances and customs and a smattering of the language of that country, with the use of the sword, both small and broad. Many and many a long mile have I trudged by his side as a lad, he telling me wonderful stories of the French king and the Irish brigade, and Marshal Saxe, and the opera dancers. He knew my uncle, too, the Chevalier Bogne, and indeed had a thousand accomplishments which he taught me in secret. I never knew a man like him for making or throwing a fly, for physicking a horse, or breaking, or choosing one. He taught me manly sports, from birds nesting upwards, and I always shall consider Phil Purcell as the very best tutor I could have had. His fault was drink, but for that I have always had a blind eye, and he hated my cousin Mick like poison, but I could excuse him that, too. With Phil, and at the age of fifteen, I was a more accomplished man than either of my cousins, and I think nature had also been more bountiful to me in the matter of person. Some of the Castle Brady girls, as you shall hear presently, adored me. At fairs and races, many of the prettiest lasses present said they would like to have me for their bachelor. And yet, somehow, it must be confessed, I, I was not popular. In the first place, everyone knew I was bitter poor, and I think perhaps it was my good mother's fault that I was bitter proud, too. I had a habit of boasting in company of my birth, and the splendor of my carriages, gardens, cellars, and domestics, and this before people who were perfectly aware of my real circumstances. If it was boys and they ventured to sneer, I would beat them, or die for it, and many's the time I've been brought home well-nigh killed by one or more of them on what, when my mother asked me, I would say was a family quarrel. Support your name with your blood, ready, my boy, would that saint say, with the tears in her eyes. And so would she herself have done with her voice, I and her teeth and nails. Thus at fifteen there was scarce a lad of twenty for half a dozen miles round that I had not beat for one cause or other. There were the vicar's two sons of Castle Brady. In course I could not associate with such beggarly brats as them, and many a battle did we have as to who should take the wall in Brady's town. There was Pat Lurgan, the blacksmith's son who had the better of me four times before we came to the crowning fight when I overcame him. And I could mention a score more of my deeds of prowess in that way, but that fisticuff facts are dull subjects to talk of, and to discuss before high-bred gentlemen and ladies. However, there is another subject, ladies, on which I must discourse, and that is never out of place. Day and night you like to hear of it, young and old you dream and think of it, Handsome and ugly, and faith, before fifty I never saw such a thing as a plain woman. It's the subject next to the hearts of all of you, and I think you guess my riddle without more trouble. 
love. Sure the word is formed on purpose out of the prettiest soft vowels and consonants in the language, and he or she who does not care to read about it is not worth a fig to my thinking. End of chapter one, part one. Chapter One, Part Two of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One, Part Two. My uncle's family consisted of ten children, who, as is the custom in such large families, were divided into two camps or parties, the one siding with their mamma, the other taking the part of my uncle in all the numerous quarrels which arose between that gentleman and his lady. Mrs. Brady's faction was headed by Mick, the eldest son, who hated me so, and disliked his father for keeping him out of his property, while Ulick, the second brother, was his father's own boy. And in revenge, Master Mick was desperately afraid of him. I need not mention the girls' names. I had plague enough with them in afterlife, heaven knows, and one of them was the cause of all my early troubles. This was, though to be sure all her sisters denied it, the belle of the family, Miss Honoria Brady by name. She said she was only nineteen at the time, but I could read the fly-leaf in the family Bible as well as another. It was one of the three books which, with the backgammon board, formed my uncle's library, and know that she was born in the year thirty-seven, and christened by Dr. Swift, Dean of St. Patrick's, Dublin. Hence she was three and twenty years old at the time she and I were so much together. When I come to think about her now, I know she never could have been handsome, for her figure was rather of the fattest, and her mouth of the widest. She was freckled over like a partridge's egg, and her hair was the color of a certain vegetable which we eat with boiled beef, to use the mildest term. Often and often would my dear mother make these remarks concerning her, but I did not believe them then, and somehow had gotten to think Honoria an angelical being, far above all the other angels of her sex. And as we know very well that a lady who is skilled in dancing or singing never can perfect herself without a deal of study in private, and that the song or the minuet which is performed with such graceful ease in the assembly room has not been acquired without vast labor and perseverance in private, so is it with the dear creatures who are skilled in coquetting. Honoria, for instance, was always practicing, and she would take poor me to rehearse her accomplishment upon, or the excise man when he came his rounds, or the steward, or the poor curate, or the young apothecary's lad from Brady's town, whom I recollect beating once for that very reason. If he's alive now, I make him my apologies. Poor fellow! as if it was his fault that he should be a victim to the wiles of one of the greatest coquettes, considering her obscure life and rustic breeding, in the world. If the truth must be told, and every word of this narrative of my life is of the most sacred veracity, my passion for Nora began in a very vulgar and unromantic way. I did not save her life. On the contrary, I once very nearly killed her, as you shall hear. I did not behold her by moonlight playing on the guitar, or rescue her from the hands of ruffians, as Alfonso does Linda Mira in the novel. But one day after dinner, at Brady's town, in summer, going into the garden to pull gooseberries for my dessert, and thinking only of gooseberries, I pledge my honor, I came upon Miss Nora and one of her sisters with whom she was friends at the time, who were both engaged in the very same amusement. "'What's the Latin for gooseberry, Redmond?' says she. She was always poking her fun, as the Irish phrase it. "'I know the Latin for goose,' says I. "'And what's that?' cries Miss Mysie, as pert as a peacock. "'Bo to you,' says I, for I never had a want of wit. And so we fell to work on the gooseberry bush, laughing and talking as happy as might be. In the course of our diversion, Nora managed to scratch her arm, and it bled, and she screamed, and it was mighty round and white, and I tied it up, and I believe was permitted to kiss her hand, and though it was 
as big and clumsy a hand as ever he saw, yet I thought the favour the most ravishing one that was ever conferred upon me, and went home in a rapture. I was much too simple a fellow to disguise any sentiment I chanced to feel in those days, and not one of the eight Castle Brady girls but was soon aware of my passion and joked and complimented Nora about her bachelor. The torments of jealousy the cruel coquette made me endure were horrible. Sometimes she would treat me as a child, sometimes as a man. She would always leave me if ever there came a stranger to the house. For after all, Redmond, she would say, you are but fifteen, and you haven't a guinea in the world. At which I would swear that I would become the greatest hero ever known out of Ireland, and vow that before I was twenty I would have money enough to purchase an entire estate six times as big as Castle Brady. All which vain promises, of course, I did not keep but I make no doubt they influenced me in my very early life, and caused me to do those great actions for which I have been celebrated, and which shall be narrated presently in order. I must tell one of them, just that my dear young lady readers may know what sort of a fellow Redmond Barry was, and what a courage and undaunted passion he had. I question whether any of the Jenny Jessamines of the present day would do half as much in the face of danger. About this time, it must be premised, the United Kingdom was in a state of great excitement from the threat generally credited of a French invasion. The pretender was said to be in high favour at Versailles, a descent upon Ireland was especially looked to, and the noblemen and people of condition in that and all other parts of the kingdom showed their loyalty by raising regiments of horse and foot to resist the invaders. Brady's town sent a company to join the Kilwangan regiment, of which Master Mick was the captain. And we had a letter from Master Ulick at Trinity College, stating that the university had also formed a regiment, in which he had the honour to be a corporal. How I envied them both, especially that odious Mick, as I saw him in his laced scarlet coat, with a ribbon in his hat, march off at the head of his men. He, the poor, spiritless creature, was a captain, and I nothing. I, who felt as much courage as the Duke of Cumberland himself, and felt, too, that a red jacket would mightily become me. My mother said I was too young to join the new regiment, but the fact was that it was she herself who was too poor, for the cost of a new uniform would have swallowed up half her year's income, and she would only have her boy appear in a way suitable to his birth riding the finest of racers, dressed in the best of clothes, and keeping the genteelest of company. Well, then, the whole company was alive with war's alarms, the three kingdoms ringing with military music, and every man of merit paying his devoir at the court of Bologna, whilst poor I was obliged to stay home in my fustian jacket and sigh for fame in secret. Mr. Mick came to and fro from the regiment, and brought numerous of his comrades with him. Their costume and swaggering airs filled me with grief, and Miss Nora's unvarying attentions to them served to make me half wild. No one, however, thought of attributing this sadness to the young lady's score, but rather to my disappointment at not being allowed to join the military profession. One of the officers of the Fencibles gave a grand ball at Kilwangan to which, as a matter of course, all the ladies of Castle Brady, and a pretty ugly coachful they were, were invited. I knew to what tortures the odious little flirt of Honora would have put me with her eternal coquettes with the officers, and refused for a long time to be one of the party to the ball. But she had a way of conquering me, against which all resistance of mine was in vain. She vowed that riding in a coach always made her ill, and how can I go to the ball, said she, unless you take me on Daisy behind you on the pillion? Daisy was a good blood mare of my uncle's, and to such a proposition I could not for my soul say no. So we rode in safety to Kilwangan, and I felt myself as proud as any prince when she promised to dance a country dance with me. When the dance was ended, the ungrateful little flirt informed me that she had quite forgotten her engagement. She had actually danced the set with an Englishman. I have endured torments in my life, but none like that. She tried to make up for her neglect, but I would not. Some of the prettiest girls there offered to console me, for I was the best dancer in the room. 
i made one attempt but was too wretched to continue and so remained all night in a state of agony i would have played but i had no money only the gold piece that my mother bade me always keep in my purse as a gentleman should i did not care for drink or know of the dreadful comfort of it in those days but i thought of killing myself and nora and most certainly of making away with captain quinn at last and at morning the ball was over the rest of our ladies went off in the lumbering creaking old coach daisy was brought out and miss nora took her place behind me which i let her do without a word but we were not half a mile out of town when she began to try with her coaxing and blandishments to dissipate my ill humour sure it's a bitter night redmond dear and you'll catch cold without a handkerchief to your neck to this sympathetic remark from the pillion the saddle made no reply did you and miss clancy have a pleasant evening redmond you were together i saw all night to this the saddle only replied by grinding his teeth and giving a lash to daisy oh mercy you'll make daisy rear and throw me you careless creature you and you know redmond i'm so timid the pillion had by this got her arm round the saddle's waist and perhaps gave it the gentlest squeeze in the world i hate miss clancy you know i do answers the saddle and i only danced with her because because the person with whom i intended to dance chose to be engaged the whole night sure there were my sisters said the pillion now laughing outright in the pride of her conscious superiority and for me my dear i had not been in the room five minutes before i was engaged for every single set were you obliged to dance five times with captain quinn said i and oh strange delicious charm of coquetry i do believe miss nora brady at twenty-three years of age felt a pang of delight in thinking that she had so much power over a guileless lad of fifteen of course she replied that she did not care a fig for captain quinn that he had danced prettily to be sure and was a pleasant rattle of a man that he looked well in his regimentals too and if he chose to ask her to dance how could she refuse him but you refused me nora oh, i can dance with you any day answered miss nora with a toss of her head and to dance with your cousin at a ball well, looks as if you could find no other partner besides said nora and this was a cruel unkind cut which showed what a power she had over me and how mercilessly she used it besides redmond captain quinn's a man and you're only a boy if ever i meet him again i roared out with an oath you shall see who is the best man of the two i'll fight him with a sword or with pistol captain as he is a man indeed i'll fight any man every man didn't i stand up to mick brady when i was eleven years old didn't i beat tom sullivan the great hulking brute who's nineteen didn't i do for the scotch usher oh nora it's cruel of you to sneer at me so but nora was in the sneering mood that night and pursued her sarcasms she pointed out that captain quinn was already known as a valiant soldier famous as a man of fashion in london and that it was mighty well of redmond to talk and boast of beating ushers and farmers boys but to fight an englishman was a very different matter then she fell to talk of the invasion and of military matters in general and of king frederick who was called in those days the protestant hero of monsieur Toureau and his fleet of monsieur conflans and his squadron of minorca how it was attacked and where it was we both agreed it must be in america and hoped the french might be soundly beaten there i sighed after a while for i was beginning to melt and said how much i longed to be a soldier on which nora recurred to her infallible ah oh, now would you leave me then but sure you're not big enough for anything more than a little drummer to which i replied by swearing that a soldier i would be and a general too as we were chatting in this silly way we came to a place that has ever since gone by the name of redmond's leap bridge it was an old high bridge over a stream sufficiently deep and rocky and as the mare daisy with her double load was crossing this bridge miss nora giving loose to her imagination and still harping on the military theme i would lay a wager that she was thinking of captain quinn miss nora said 
suppose now redmond you who are such a hero was passing over the bridge and the enemy on the other side i draw my sword and cut my way through them what with me on the pillion would you kill poor me this young lady was perpetually speaking of poor me well then i'll tell you what i'd do i'd jump daisy into the river and swim you both across where no enemy could follow us jump twenty feet you wouldn't dare to do any such thing on daisy there's the captain's horse black george i've heard say that captain quint she never finished the word for maddened by the continual recurrence of that odious monosyllable i shouted to her to hold tight by my waist and giving daisy the spur in a minute sprang with nora over the parapet into the deep water below i don't know why now whether it was i wanted to drown myself and nora or to perform an act that even captain quinn should crane at or whether i fancied that the enemy actually was in front of us i can't tell now but over i went the horse sank over his head the girl screamed as she sank and screamed as she rose and i landed her half fainting on the shore where we were soon found by my uncle's people who returned on hearing the screams i went home and was ill speedily of a fever which kept me to my bed for six weeks and i quitted my couch prodigiously increased in stature and at the same time still more violently in love than i had been even before at the commencement of my illness miss nora had been pretty constant in her attendance at my bedside forgetting for the sake of me the quarrel between my mother and her family which my good mother was likewise pleased in the most christian manner to forget and let me tell you it was no small mark of goodness in a woman of her haughty disposition who as a rule never forgave anybody for my sake to give up her hostility to miss brady and to receive her kindly for like a mad boy as i was it was nora i was always raving about and asking for i would only accept medicines from her hand and would look rudely and sulkily upon the good mother who loved me better than anything else in the world and gave up even her favorite habits the proper and becoming jealousies to make me happy as i got well i saw that nora's visits became daily more rare why doesn't she come i would say peevishly a dozen times in the day in reply to which query mrs barry would be obliged to make the best excuses she could find such as that nora had sprained her ankle or that they had quarrelled together or some other answer to soothe me and many a time has the good soul left me to go and break her heart in her own room alone and come back with a smiling face so that i should know nothing of her mortification nor indeed did i take much pains to ascertain it nor should i i fear have been very much touched even if i had discovered it for the commencement of manhood i think is the period of our extremest selfishness we get such a desire then to take wing and leave the parent nest that no tears entreaties or feelings of affection will counterbalance this overpowering longing after independence she must have been very sad that poor mother of mine heaven be good to her at that period of my life and has often told me since what a pang of the heart it was to her to see all her care and affection of years forgotten by me in a minute and for the sake of a little heartless jilt who was only playing with me while she could get no better suitor for the fact is that during the last four weeks of my illness no other than captain quinn was staying at castle brady and making love to miss nora in form my mother did not dare to break this news to me and you may be sure that nora herself kept it a secret it was only by chance that i discovered it shall i tell you how the minx had been to see me one day as i sat up in my bed convalescent she was in such high spirits and so gracious and kind to me that my heart poured over with joy and gladness and i had even for my poor mother a kind word and a kiss that morning i felt myself so well that i ate up a whole chicken and promised to my uncle who had come to see me to be ready against partridge shooting to accompany him as my custom was the next day but one was a saturday 
and I had a project for that day which I determined to realize in spite of all the doctor's and my mother's injunctions, which were that I was on no account to leave the house, for the fresh air would be the death of me. Well, I lay wondrous quiet composing a copy of verses, the first I ever made in my life, and I give them here, spelt as I spelt them in those days when I knew no better. And although they are not so polished and elegant as Ardelia ease a lovesick swain, and when Saul bedecks the daisied mead, and other lyrical effusions of mine which obtained me so much reputation in after life, I still think them pretty good for a humble lad of fifteen. The Rose of Flora, sent by a young gentleman of quality to Miss Brady of Castle Brady. On Brady's tower there grows a flower. It is the loveliest flower that blows. At Castle Brady there lives a lady, and how I love her no one knows. Her name is Nora, and the goddess Flora presents her with this blooming rose. O oh, Lady Nora, says the goddess Flora, I've many a rich and bright parterre. In Brady's towers there's seven more flowers, but you're the fairest lady there. Not all the county nor Ireland's bounty can produce a treasure that's half so fair. What cheek is redder? Sure roses fed her. Her hair is marigolds and her eye of blue. Beneath her eyelid is like the violet that darkly glistens with gentle dew. The lily's nature is not surely whiter than Nora's neck is, and her arms too. Come, gentle Nora, says the goddess Flora, my dearest creature, take my advice. There is a poet, full well you know it, who spends his lifetime in heavy sighs. Young Redmond Barry, tis him you'll marry, if rhyme and raisin you'll choose likewise. On Sunday, no sooner was my mother gone to church than I summoned Phil the valet, and insisted upon his producing my best suit in which I arrayed myself, although I found that I had shot up so in my illness that the old dress was woefully too small for me, and, with my notable copy of verses in my hand, ran down towards Castle Brady, bent upon beholding my beauty. The air was so fresh and bright, and the birds sang so loud amidst the garden trees that I felt more elated than I had been for months before, and sprang down the avenue. My uncle had cut down every stick of the trees, by the way, as brisk as a young fawn. My heart began to thump as I mounted the grass-grown steps of the terrace and passed in by the rickety hall door. The master and mistress were at church, Mr. Screw, the butler told me, after giving a start back at seeing my altered appearance and gaunt, lean figure, and so were six of the young ladies. Was Miss Nora one? I asked. No, Miss Nora was not one, said Mr. Screw, assuming a very puzzled and yet knowing look. Where was she? To this question he answered, or rather made believe to answer, with usual Irish ingenuity and left me to settle whether she was gone to kill Wangan on the pillion behind her brother, or whether she and her sister had gone for a walk, or whether she was ill in her room. And while I was settling this query, Mr. Screw left me abruptly. I rushed away to the back court, where the Castle Brady stables stand, and there I found a dragoon whistling the roast beef of old England as he cleaned down a cavalry horse. "'Whose horse, fellow, is that?' cried I. "'Feller, indeed,' replied the Englishman. "'The horse belongs to my captain, "'and he's a better feller nor you any day.' "'I did not stop to break his bones, "'as I would on another occasion, "'for a horrible suspicion had come across me, "'and I made for the garden as quickly as I could. "'I knew somehow what I should see there. "'I saw Captain Quinn and Nora pacing the alley together.' Her arm was under his, and the scoundrel was fondling and squeezing the hand which lay closely nestling against his odious waistcoat. Some distance beyond them was Captain Fagan of the Kilwangan Regiment, who was paying court to Nora's sister, Mysie. 
I'm not afraid of any man or ghost. But as I saw that sight, my knees fell a-trembling violently under me, and such a sickness came over me, that I was fain to sink down on the grass by a tree against which I leaned, and lost almost all consciousness for a minute or two. Then I gathered myself up, and, advancing towards the couple on the walk, loosened the blade of the little silver-hilted hanger I always wore in its scabbard, for I was resolved to pass it through the bodies of the delinquents, and split them like two pigeons. I don't tell what feelings else besides those of rage were passing through my mind, what bitter blank disappointment, what mad wild despair, what a sensation, as if the whole world was tumbling from under me. I make no doubt that my reader hath been jilted by the ladies many times, and so bid him recall his own sensations when the shock first fell upon him. "'No, Noralia,' said the captain, for it was the fashion of those times for lovers to call themselves by the most romantic names out of novels. "'Except for you and four others, I vow before all the gods my heart has never felt the soft flame. "'Ah, you men, you men, Eugenio,' said she. The beast's name was John. "'Your passion is not equal to ours. We are like, like some plant I've read of, we bear but one flower, and then we die. Do you mean you've never felt an inclination for another? said Captain Quinn. Never, my Eugenio, but for thee. How can you ask a blushing nymph such a question? Darling Noralia, said he, raising her hand to his lips. I had a knot of cherry-colored ribbons, which she had given me out of her breast and which, somehow, I always wore upon me. I pulled these out of my bosom and flung them in Captain Quinn's face, and rushed out with my little sword drawn, shrieking, She's a liar! She's a liar, Captain Quinn! Draw, sir, and defend yourself if you are a man! And with these words I leapt at the monster and collared him, while Nora made the air echo with their screams, at the sound of which the other captain and Mysie hastened up. Although I sprang up like a weed in my illness, and was now nearly attained at my full growth of six feet, yet I was but a laugh by the side of the enormous English captain, who had calves and shoulders, such as no chairman at Bath ever boasted. He turned very red, and then exceedingly pale at my attack upon him, and slipped back and clutched at his sword, when Nora, in an agony of terror, flung herself round him, screaming, Eugenio! Captain Quinn, for heaven's sake, spare the child. He is but an infant. And ought to be whipped for his impudence, said the captain. But never fear, Miss Brady, I shall not touch him. Your favorite is safe from me. So saying, he stooped down and picked up the bunch of ribbons which had fallen at Nora's feet, and handing it to her, said in a sarcastic tone, When ladies make presents to gentlemen, it is time for other gentlemen to retire. "'Good heavens, Quinn!' cried the girl. "'He is but a boy!' "'I am a man,' roared I, "'and will prove it. "'And don't signify any more than my parrot or lapdog. "'Mayn't I give a bit of ribbon to my own cousin?' "'You're perfectly welcome, miss,' continued the captain, "'as many yards as you like.' "'Monster!' exclaimed the dear girl. "'Your father was a tailor, and you're always thinking of the shop. "'But I'll have my revenge, I will.' Ready, will you see me insulted? Indeed, Miss Nora, says I, I intend to have his blood as sure as my name's Redmond. I'll send for the usher to cane you, little boy, said the captain, regaining his self-possession. But as for you, miss, I have the honor to wish you a good day. He took off his hat with much ceremony, made a low congé, and was just walking off when Mick, my cousin, came up, whose ear had likewise been caught by the scream. Hoity toity! Jack Quinn, what's the matter here? says Mick. Nora in tears, Redmond's ghost here with his sword drawn, and you making a bow. I'll tell you what it is, Mr. Brady, said the Englishman. I've had enough of Miss Nora here, and your Irish ways. I ain't used to em, sir. Well, well, what is it? said Mick, good humouredly. For he owed Quinn a great deal of money, as it turned out. We'll make you used to our ways, or adopt English ones. It's not the English way for ladies to have two lovers. 
the hanglish way as the captain called it and so mr brady i'll thank you to pay me the sum you owe me and i'll resign all claims to this young lady if she has a fancy for schoolboys let her take em sir pooh pooh quinn you're joking said mick i never was more in earnest replied the other by heaven then look to yourself shouted mick infamous seducer infernal deceiver you come and wind your toils round this suffering angel here you win her heart and leave her and fancy her brother won't defend her draw this minute you slave and let me cut the wicked heart out of your body this is regular assassination said quinn starting back there's two on em at me at once fagin you won't let him murder me faith said captain fagin who seemed mightily amused you may settle your own quarrel captain quinn and coming over to me whispered at him again you little fellow as long as captain quinn withdraws his claim said i i of course do not interfere i do sir i do said quinn more and more flustered then defend yourself like a man curse you cried mick again mysie lead this poor victim away redmond and fagin will see fair play between us well now i don't give, give me time I, i'm puzzled I, I i don't know which way to look like the donkey betwixt the two bundles of hay said mr fagin dryly and there's pretty pickings on either side End of chapter one part two Chapter two of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon Esquire by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two I show myself to be a man of spirit. During this dispute, my cousin Nora did the only thing that a lady under such circumstances could do, and fainted in due form. I was in hot altercation with Mick at the time where I should have, of course, flown to her assistance but captain fagin a dry sort of fellow this fagin was prevented me saying i advise you to leave the young lady to herself master redmond and be sure she will come to and so indeed after a while she did which has shown me since that fagin knew the world pretty well for many's the lady i've seen in after times recover in a similar manner quinn did not offer to help her you may be sure for in the midst of the diversion caused by her screaming the faithless bully stole away. "'Which of us is Captain Quinn to engage?' said I to Mick, for it was my first affair, and I was as proud of it as of a suit of laced velvet. "'Is it you or I, Cousin Mick, that is to have the honour of chastising this insolent Englishman?' And I held out my hand as I spoke, for my heart melted towards my cousin under the triumph of the moment. But he rejected the proffered offer of friendship." you you said he in a towering passion hang you for a meddling brat your hand is in everybody's pie what business had you to come brawling and quarrelling here with a gentleman who has fifteen hundred a year oh gasped nora from the stone bench i shall die i know i shall i shall never leave this spot the captain's not gone yet whispered fagin on which nora giving him an indignant look jumped up and walked towards the house meanwhile mick continued what business have you you meddling rascal to interfere with a daughter of this house rascal yourself roared i call me another such name mick brady and i'll drive my hanger into your weasand recollect i stood to you when i was eleven years old i'm your match now and by jove provoke me and i'll beat you like like your younger brother always did that was a home cut and i saw mick turn blue with fury this is a pretty way to recommend yourself to the family said fagin in a soothing tone the girl's old enough to be his mother growled mick old or not i replied you'll listen to this mick brady and i swore a tremendous oath that need not be put down here the man that marries nora brady must first kill me do you mind that pooh sir said mick turning away kill you flog you you mean i'll send for nick the huntsman to do it and so he went off captain fagin now came up and 
taking me kindly by the hand, said I was a gallant lad, and he liked my spirit. But what Brady says is true, continued he. It's a hard thing to give a lad counsel who is in such a far-gone state as you. But, believe me, I know the world, and if you will but follow my advice, you won't regret having taken it. Nora Brady has not a penny. You're not a whit richer. You're but fifteen, and she's four and twenty. In ten years, when you're old enough to marry, she'll be an old woman. And my poor boy, don't you see, though it's a hard matter to see, that she's a flirt and does not care a pin for you or Quinn either? But who in love, or in any other point for the matter of that, listens to advice? I never did. And I told Captain Fagin fairly that Nora might love me or not as she liked, but that Quinn should fight me before he married her. That I swore. Faith, says Fagin, I think you're a lad that's likely to keep your word. And, looking hard at me for a second or two, he walked away likewise, humming a tune. And I saw he looked back at me as he went through the old gate out of the garden. When he was gone, and I was quite alone, I flung myself down on the bench where Nora had made believe to faint, and had left her handkerchief, and, taking it up, hid my face in it, and burst into such a passion of tears as I would have had nobody see for the world. The crumpled ribbon which I had flung at Quinn lay in the walk, and I sat there for hours, as wretched as any man in Ireland, I believe, for the time being. But it's a changeable world. When we consider how great our sorrows seem, and how small they are, how we think we shall die of grief, and how quickly we forget, I think we ought to be ashamed of ourselves and our fickle-heartedness. For after all, what business has time to bring us consolation? I have not, perhaps, in the course of my multifarious adventures and experience, hit upon the right woman, and have forgotten, after a little, every single creature I adored. But I think, if I could have but lighted on the right one, I would have loved her for ever. I must have sat for some hours bemoaning myself on the garden bench, for it was morning when I came to Castle Brady, and the dinner bell clanged as usual at three o'clock which wakened me up from my reverie. Presently I gathered up the handkerchief and once more took the ribbon. As I passed through the offices, I saw the captain's saddle was still hanging up at the stable door, and saw his odious red-coated brute of a servant swaggering with the scullion girls and kitchen people. "'The Englishman's still there, Master Redmond,' said one of the maids to me, a sentimental black-eyed girl who waited on the young ladies. He's there in the parlor with the sweetest fillet of veil. Go in, and don't let him browbeat you, Master Redmond. And in I went, and took my place at the bottom of the big table, as usual, and my friend the butler speedily brought me a cover. Hello, Reddy, my boy, said my uncle. Up and well. That's right. He'd better be home with his mother, growled my aunt. Don't mind her, says Uncle Brady. It's the cold goose she ate at breakfast didn't agree with her. Take a glass of spirits, Mrs. Brady, to Redmond's health. It was evident he did not know of what had happened. But Mick, who was at dinner too, and Ulick, and almost all the girls, looked exceedingly black, and the captain foolish. And Miss Nora, who was again by his side, ready to cry. Captain Fagin sat smiling, and I looked on as cold as a stone. I thought the dinner would choke me, but I was determined to put a good face on it, and when the cloth was drawn, filled my glass with the rest, and we drank the king and church, as gentlemen should. My uncle was in high good humor, and especially always joking with Nora and the captain. It was, Nora, divide that merry thought with the captain. See who'll be married first. <laughs> Jack Quinn, my dear boy, Never mind a clean glass for the claret. We're short of crystal at Castle Brady. Take Nora's and the wine will taste none the worse. And so on. He was in the highest glee. I did not know why. Had there been a reconciliation between the faithless girl and her lover since they had come into the house? I learned the truth very soon. At the third toast it was always the custom for the ladies to withdraw, but my uncle stopped them this time in spite of the remonstrances of Nora, who said, Oh, Pa, do let us go, and said, No, Mrs. Brady and ladies, if you please, 
this is a sort of toast that is drunk a great deal too seldom in my family and you'll please to receive it with all the honours here is captain and mrs john quinn and long life to them kiss her jack you rogue for faith you've got a treasure he has already i screeched out springing up hold your tongue you fool hold your tongue said big ulick who sat by me but i wouldn't hear he has already i screamed been slapped in the face this morning captain john quinn he's already been called coward captain john quinn and this is the way i'll drink his health here's your health captain john quinn and i flung a glass of claret into his face i don't know how he looked after it for the next moment i myself was under the table tripped up by ulick who hit me a violent cuff on the head as i went down and i had hardly leisure to hear the general screaming and scurrying that was taking place above me being so fully occupied with kicks and thumps and curses with which ulick was belaboring me you fool roared he you great blundering marplot you silly beggarly brat a thump at each hold your tongue these blows from ulick of course i did not care for for he had always been my friend and had been in the habit of thrashing me all my life when i got up from under the table all the ladies were gone and i had the satisfaction of seeing the captain's nose was bleeding as mine was his was cut across the bridge and his beauty spoiled for ever ulick shook himself sat down quietly filled a bumper and pushed the bottle to me there you young donkey said he suck that and let's hear no more of your braying in heaven's name what does all the row mean said my uncle is the boy in the fever again it's all your fault said mick sulkily yours and those who brought him here hold your noise mick says ulick turning on him speak civil of my father and me and don't let me be called upon to teach you manners it is your fault repeated mick what business has the vagabond here if i had my will i'd have flogged and turned him out and so he should be said captain quinn you'd best not try it quinn said ulick who was always my champion and turning to his father the fact is sir that the young monkey has fallen in love with nora and finding her and the captain mighty sweet in the garden to-day he was for murdering jack quinn gad he's beginning young said my uncle quite good-humouredly faith fagin that boy's a brady every inch of him and i'll tell you what mr b cried quinn bristling up i've been insulted grossly in this house i ain't at all satisfied with these here ways of going on i'm an englishman i am and a man of property and i-i if you're insulted and not satisfied remember there's two of us quinn said ulick gruffly on which the captain fell to washing his nose in water and answered never a word mr quinn said i in the most dignified tone i could assume may also have satisfaction any time he pleases by calling on redmond barry esq of barryville at which speech my uncle burst out a-laughing as he did at everything and in this laugh captain fagin much to my mortification joined i turned rather smartly upon him however and bade him to understand that as for my cousin ulick who had been my best friend throughout life i could put up with rough treatment from him yet though i was a boy even that sort of treatment i would bear from him no longer and any other person who ventured on the like would find me a man to their cost mr quinn i added knows this fact very well and if he's a man he'll know where to find me my uncle now observed that it was getting late and that my mother would be anxious about me one of you had better go home with him said he turning to his sons or the lad may be playing more pranks but ulick said with a nod to his brother both of us ride home with quinn here i'm not afraid of frenny's people said the captain with a faint attempt at a laugh my man is armed and so am i you know the use of arms very well quinn said ulick and no one can doubt your courage but mick and i will see you home for all that why you'll not be home till morning boys kilwangan's a good ten mile from here 
we'll sleep at quinn's quarters replied ulick we're going to stop a week there thank you says quinn very faint it's very kind of you you'll be lonely you know without us oh yes very lonely says quinn and in another week my boy says ulick and here he whispered something in the captain's ear in which i thought i caught the words marriage parson and felt all my fury returning again as you please whined out the captain and the horses were quickly brought round and the three gentlemen rode away fagin stopped and at my uncle's injunction walked across the old treeless park with me he said that after the quarrel at dinner he thought i would scarcely want to see the ladies that night in which opinion i concurred entirely and so we went off without an adieu a pretty good day's work of it you have made master redmond said he what you a friend to the brady's and knowing your uncle to be distressed for money try and break off a match which will bring fifteen hundred a year into the family quinn has promised to pay off the four thousand pounds which is bothering your uncle so he takes a girl without a penny a girl with no more beauty than yonder bullock well well don't look furious let's say she is handsome there's no accounting for tastes a girl that's been flinging herself at the head of every man in these parts these past ten years and missing them all and you as poor as herself a boy of fifteen well sixteen if you insist and a boy who ought to be attached to your uncle as to your father and so i am said i and this is the return you make him for his kindness didn't he harbor you in his house when you were an orphan and hasn't he given you rent-free your fine mansion of berryville yonder and now when his affairs can be put into order and a chance offers for his old age to be made comfortable who flings himself in the way of him and competence you of all others the man in the world most obliged to him it's wicked ungrateful unnatural for a lad of such spirit as you are i expect a truer courage i'm not afraid of any man alive exclaimed i for this latter part of the captain's argument had rather staggered me and i wished of course to turn it as one always should when the enemy is too strong and it's i am the injured man captain fagin no man was ever since the world began treated so look here look at this ribbon i've worn it in my heart for six months i've had it there all the time of the fever didn't nora take it out of her own bosom and give it to me didn't she kiss it when she gave it to me and call me her darling redmond she was practising replied mr fagin with a sneer i know women sir give them time and let nobody else come to the house and they'll fall in love with a chimney sweep there was a young lady in fermoy a young lady in flames roared i but i used a still hotter word mark this come what will of it i swear i'll fight the man who pretends to the hand of nora brady i'll follow him if it's into the church and meet him there i'll have his blood or he shall have mine and this ribbon shall be found dyed in it yes and if i kill him i'll pin it on his breast and then she may go and take back her token this i said because i was very much excited at the time and because i had not read novels and romantic plays for nothing well says fagin after a pause if it must be it must for a young fellow you are the most bloodthirsty i ever saw quinn's a determined fellow too will you take my message to him said i quite eagerly hush said fagin your mother may be on the lookout here we are close to berryville mind not a word to my mother i said and went into the house swelling with pride and exultation to think that i should have a chance to fight against the englishman i hated so tim my servant had come up from berryville on my mother's return from church for the good lady was rather alarmed at my absence and anxious for my return but he had seen me go in to dinner at the invitation of the sentimental lady's maid and when he had had his own share of the good things in the kitchen which was always better furnished than ours at home had walked back to inform his mistress where i was and no doubt to tell her in his own fashion of all the events that had happened at castle brady in spite of my precautions to secrecy then 
I half suspected that my mother knew all, from the manner in which she embraced me on arrival and received our guest, Captain Fagin. The poor soul looked a little anxious and flushed, and every now and then gazed very hard in the captain's face. But she said not a word about the quarrel, for she had a noble spirit, and would as lief had seen any one of her kindred hanged as shirking from the field of honour. What has become of those gallant feelings nowadays? Sixty years ago a man was a man in old Ireland, and the sword that was worn by his side was at the service of any gentleman's gizzard upon the slightest difference. But the good old times and usages are fast fading away. One scarcely ever hears of a fair meeting now, and the use of those cowardly pistols in place of the honourable and manly weapon of gentlemen has introduced a deal of knavery into the practice of dueling that cannot be sufficiently deplored. When I arrived at home I felt that I was a man in earnest, and welcoming Captain Fagin to Berryville and introducing him to my mother in a majestic and dignified way, said the captain must be thirsty after his walk and called upon Tim to bring up a bottle of the yellow-sealed Bordeaux and cakes and glasses immediately. Tim looked at the mistress in great wonderment, and the fact is, that six hours previous I would as soon have thought of burning the house down as calling for a bottle of claret on my own account. But I felt I was a man now, and had a right to command. And my mother felt this too, for she turned to the fellow and said sharply, Don't you hear, you rascal, what your master says? Go, get the wine and the cakes and glasses directly. Then, for you may be sure she did not give Tim the keys of our little cellar, she went and got the liquor herself, and Tim brought it in on the silver tray, in due form. My dear mother poured out the wine and drank the captain welcome, but I observed her hands shook very much as she performed this courteous duty, and the bottle went clink, clink, against the glass. When she had tasted her glass, she said she had a headache and would go to bed, and so I asked her blessing, as becomes a dutiful son, the modern bloods have given up the respectful ceremonies which distinguished a gentleman in my time, and she left me and Captain Fagin to talk over our important business. Indeed, said the captain, I see now no other way out of the scrape than a meeting. The fact is, there was a talk of it at Castle Brady, after your attack upon Quinn this afternoon, and he vowed that he would cut you in pieces, but the tears and supplications of Miss Honoria induced him, though very unwillingly, to relent. Now, however, matters have gone too far. No officer bearing his majesty's commission can receive a glass of wine on the nose. This claret of yours is very good, by the way, and by your leave will ring for another bottle. Without resenting the affront. Fight you must, and Quinn is a huge, strong fellow. He'll give the better mark, said I. I'm not afraid of him. In faith, said the captain, I believe you are not. For a lad... I never saw more game in my life. Look at that sword, sir, says I, pointing to an elegant silver-mounted one in a white shagreen case that hung on the mantelpiece, under the picture of my father, Harry Barry. It was with that sword, sir, that my father pinked Mohawk O'Driscoll in Dublin in the year 1740. With that sword, sir, he met Sir Huddleston Fuddleston, the Hampshire baronet, and ran him through the neck. They met on horseback with sword and pistol on Hounslow Heath, as I dare say you have heard tell of, and those are the pistols, they hung on each side of the picture, which the gallant Barry used. He was quite in the wrong, having insulted Lady Fuddleston when in liquor at the Brentford Assembly, but, like a gentleman, he scorned to apologize, and Sir Huddleston received a ball through his hat before they engaged with the sword. I am Harry Barry's son, sir, and will act as becomes my name and my quality. Give me a kiss, my dear boy, said Fagin with tears in his eyes. You're after my own soul. As long as Jack Fagin lives, you shall never want a friend or a second. Poor fellow, he was shot six months afterwards, carrying orders to my lord George Sackville at Minden, and I lost thereby a kind friend. But we don't know what is in store for us, and that night was a merry one, at least. We had a second bottle, and a third, too. 
I could hear the poor mother going downstairs for each, but she never came into the parlour with them, and sent them in by the butler, Mr. Tim. And we parted at length, he engaging to arrange matters with Mr. Quinn's second that night, and to bring me news in the morning as to the place where the meeting should take place. I have often thought since how different my fate might have been had I not fallen in love with Nora at that early age, and had I not flung the wine in Quinn's face and so brought on the duel. I might have settled down in Ireland but for that, for Miss Quinlan was an heiress within twenty miles of us, and Peter Burke of Kilwangan left his daughter Judy seven hundred pounds a year, and I might have had either of them had I waited a few years. But it was in my fate to be a wanderer, and that battle with Quinn sent me on my travels at a very early age, as you shall hear anon. I never slept sounder in my life, though I woke a little earlier than usual, and you may be sure my first thought was of the event of the day for which I was fully prepared. I had ink and pen in my room. Had I not been writing those verses to Nora but the day previous like a poor fond fool as I was? And now I sat down and wrote a couple of letters more. They might be the last, thought I, that I ever should write in my life. The first was to my mother. Honoured madam, I wrote, this will not be given you unless I fall by the hand of Captain Quinn, whom I meet this day in the field of honour with sword and pistol. If I die, it is as a good Christian and a gentleman. How should I be otherwise when educated by such a mother as you? I forgive all my enemies. I beg your blessing as a dutiful son. I desire that my mare, Nora, which my uncle gave me and which I called after the most faithless of her sex, may be returned to Castle Brady, and beg you will give my silver-hiked hanger to Phil Purcell, the gamekeeper. Present my duty to my uncle and Ulick, and all the girls of my party there, and I remain your dutiful son, Redmond Barry. To Nora I wrote, this letter will be found in my bosom, along with the token you gave me. It will be dyed in my blood, unless I have Captain Quinn's, whom I hate but forgive, and will be a pretty ornament for you on your marriage day. Wear it, and think of the poor boy to whom you gave it, and who died, as he was always ready to do, for your sake. Redmond These letters being written and sealed with my father's great silver seal of the Berry Arms, I went down to breakfast, where my mother was waiting for me, you may be sure. We did not say a single word about what was taking place. On the contrary, we talked of anything but that, about who was at church the day before, and about my wanting new clothes now I was grown so tall. She said I must have a suit against winter, if, if, she could afford it. She winced, rather, at the if, heaven bless her. I knew what was in her mind. And then she fell to telling me about the black pig that must be killed, and that she had found the speckled hen's nest that morning, whose eggs I liked so, and other such trifling talk. Some of these eggs were for breakfast, and I ate them with a good appetite, but in helping myself to salt I spilled it, on which she started up with a scream. "'Thank God!' said she. "'It's fallen towards me!' And then, her heart being too full, she left the room. Ah. They have their faults, those mothers, but are there any other women like them? When she was gone, I went to take down the sword with which my father had vanquished the Hampshire baronet, and would you believe it, the brave woman had tied a new ribbon to the hilt, for indeed she had the courage of a lioness and a Brady united. And then I took down the pistols, which were always kept bright and well-oiled, and put some fresh flints I had into the locks, and got balls and powder ready against the captain should come. There was claret and a cold fowl put ready for him on the sideboard, and a case of old brandy, too, with a couple of little glasses on the silver tray with the berry arms emblazoned. In after life, and in the midst of my fortune and splendor, I paid thirty-five guineas, and almost as much more interest, to the London goldsmith who supplied my father with that very tray. A scoundrel pawnbroker would only give me sixteen for it afterwards. <laughs> So little can we trust the honour of rascally tradesmen. At eleven o'clock, Captain Fagin arrived on horseback, with a mounted dragoon after him. 
he paid his compliments to the collation which my mother's care had provided for him and then said look ye redmond my boy this is a silly business the girl will marry quinn mark my words and as sure as she does you'll forget her you're but a boy quinn is willing to consider you as such dublin's a fine place and if you have a mind to take a ride thither and see the town for a month here are twenty guineas at your service make quinn an apology and be off a man of honour mr fagin says i dies but never apologizes i'll see the captain hanged before i apologize and there's nothing for it but a meeting my mare is saddled and ready says i where's the meeting and who's the captain's second your cousins go out with him answered mr fagin i'll ring for my groom to bring my mare round i said as soon as you have rested yourself tim was accordingly dispatched for nora and i rode away but i didn't take leave of mrs berry the curtains of her bedroom were down and they didn't move as we mounted and trotted off but two hours afterwards you should have seen her as she came tottering downstairs and heard the scream which she gave as she hugged her boy to her heart quite unharmed and without a wound in his body what had taken place i may as well tell here when we got to the ground ulick mick and the captain were already there quinn flaming in red regimentals as big a monster as ever led a grenadier company the party were laughing together at some joke of one or the other and i must say i thought this laughter very unbecoming in my cousins who were met perhaps to see the death of one of their kindred i hope to spoil this sport says i to captain fagin in a great rage and trust to see this sword of mine in yonder big bully's body oh it's with pistols we fight replied mr fagin you're no match for quinn with a sword i'll match any man with a sword said i but swords are to-day impossible captain quinn is is lame he knocked his knee against the swinging park gate last night as he was riding home and can scarce move it now not against castle brady gate says i that has been off the hinges these ten years on which fagin said it must have been some other gate and repeated what he had said to mr quinn and my cousins when on alighting from our horses we joined and saluted those gentlemen oh yes dead lame said ulick coming to shake me by the hand while captain quinn took off his hat and turned extremely red and very lucky for you redmond my boy continued ulick you are a dead man else for he's a devil of a fellow isn't he fagin a regular turk answered fagin adding i never knew yet the man who stood to captain quinn hang the business said ulick i hate it i'm ashamed of it say you're sorry redmond you can easily say that if the young fellow will not go to doubling as proposed here interposed mr quinn i'm not sorry i'll not apologize and i'll as soon go to dublin as to said i with a stamp of my foot <laughs> there's nothing else for it said ulick with a laugh to fagin take your ground fagin twelve paces i suppose ten sir said mr quinn in a big voice and make them short ones do you hear captain fagin don't bully mr quinn said ulick surlily here are the pistols and he added with some emotion to me god bless you my boy and when i count three fire mr fagin put my pistol into my hand that is not one of mine which were to serve if need were for the next round but one of ulick's they're all right said he never fear and redmond fire at his neck hit him there under the gorget and see how the fool shows himself open mick who had never spoken a word ulick and the captain retired to one side and ulick gave the signal it was slowly given and i had leisure to cover my man well i saw him changing colour and trembling as the numbers were given at three both our pistols went off i heard something whiz by me and my antagonist giving a most horrible groan staggered backwards and fell he's down he's down cried the seconds running towards him 
Ulick lifted him up. Mick took his head. "'He's hit here in the neck,' said Mick, and laying open his coat, blood was seen gurgling from under his gorget at the very spot at which I aimed. "'How's it with you?' said Ulick. "'Is he really hit?' said he, looking hard at him. The unfortunate man did not answer, but when the support of Ulick's arm was withdrawn from his back, groaned once more and fell backwards. "'The young fellow's begun well,' said Mick with a scowl. "'You'd better ride off, young sir, before the police are up. They had wind of the business before we left Kowangan. "'Is he quite dead?' said I. "'Quite dead,' answered Mick. "'Then the world's rid of a coward,' said Captain Fagin, giving the huge prostrate body a scornful kick with his foot. "'It's all over with him, Reddy. He doesn't stir.' "'We are not cowards, Fagin,' said Ulick roughly, whatever he was. "'Let's get the boy off as quick as we may. "'You shall go for a cart and take away the body of this unhappy gentleman. "'This has been a sad day's work for our family, Redmond Barry. "'You have robbed us of fifteen hundred pounds a year.' "'It was Nora did it,' said I, not I. "'And I took the ribbon she gave me out of my waistcoat, and the letter, "'and flung them down on the body of Captain Quinn. "'There,' says I. Take her those ribbons. She'll know what they mean. And that's all that's left to her of two lovers she had and ruined. I did not feel any horror or fear, young as I was, in seeing my enemy prostrate before me, for I knew that I had met and conquered him honorably in the field, as became a man of my name and blood. And now, in heaven's name, get the youngster out of the way, said Mick. Ulick said he would ride with me and off accordingly we galloped, never drawing bridle till we came to my mother's door. When there, Ulick told Tim to feed my mare, as I would have far to ride that day, and I was in the poor mother's arms in a minute. I need not tell how great were her pride and exultation when she heard from Ulick's lips the account of my behavior at the duel. He urged, however, that I should go into hiding for a short time, and it was agreed between them that I should drop my name of Barry, and, taking that of Redmond, go to Dublin, and there wait until matters were blown over. The arrangement was not come to without some discussion, for why should I not be as safe at Barryville, she said, as my cousin and Ulick at Castle Brady? Bailiffs and duns never got near them. Why should constables be engaged to come upon me? but Ulick persisted in the necessity of my instant departure, in which argument, as I was anxious to see the world, I must confess, I sided with him, and my mother was brought to see that in our small house at Berryville, in the midst of the village, and with the guard but of a couple of servants, escape would be impossible. So the kind soul was forced to yield to my cousin's entreaties, who promised her, however, that the affair would soon be arranged and that I should be restored to her. Ah, how little did he know what fortune was in store for me. My dear mother had some forebodings, I think, that our separation was to be a long one, for she told me that all night long she had been consulting the cards regarding my fate in the duel, and that all the signs betokened a separation. Then, taking out a stocking from her escritoire, the kind soul put twenty guineas in a purse for me, she had herself but twenty-five, and made up a little valise to be placed at the back of my mare in which were my clothes, linen, and a silver dressing-case of my father's. She bade me, too, to keep the sword and the pistols I had known to use so like a man. She hurried my departure now, though her heart, I know, was full, and almost in half an hour after my arrival at home I was once more on the road again, with the wide world, as it were, before me. I need not tell how Tim and the cook cried at my departure, and mayhap I had a tear or two myself in my eyes. But no lad of sixteen is very sad, who has liberty for the first time, and twenty guineas in his pocket. And I rode away thinking, I confess, not so much of the kind mother left alone, and of the home behind me, as of tomorrow, and all the wonders it would bring. End of chapter 2